guess I've had the uh, opportunity to meet and talk to a lot of the people here. Um, I've talked about uh, great practitioners, visionaries, regulators, and uh, innovators as well. So I feel um, it is my chance to share some of my understandings of the uh, global C derivative market and how it's a natural use case for uh, blockchain technology. Well, please ignore the pictures of that. Um, apparently, someone's too good at Photoshop. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to uh, give a little bit background of myself. So I got back on both computer science and financial mathematics. Um, I got my degree from Yale and the University of Chicago. Um, and before I joined Fortuna full time, I spent six years in Chicago doing work in the quantitative field. Um, I was a financial engineer for fixed income and fixed income derivatives. And then I spent some time as a quantitative trader. And then um, right before I joined Fortuna, I was a quant analyst at the OCC, the Option Clearing Corporation, uh, which was the uh, Clearing house for all US equity options and many other derivatives as well. So, many of you who were here yesterday probably heard uh, from the presentation of Jennifer Jane Hu. She said it is only a matter of time before uh, for financial instruments to be traded on blockchain, so for example, derivatives. That is very, that is a very encouraging message. Um, but why derivatives and why blockchain? Why do we put these things, two things together? These questions are uh, what I'm trying to share some of my insight with you today in my presentation. The presentation will be divided into four sections by Kanzu. Overview of derivatives, uh, market and uses, its core problems, and the possible solution. So first, in order to answer these questions, what are derivatives really? Um, I'm sure we have financial professionals here. Um, even those of you who are now probably have heard of things like options, futures, swaps, swaps, right? Interest rate derivatives. Um, and, but what are they really? What do they share in common? Uh, one definition given by ZT itself is a derivative is a contract whose worth is derived from, from some future conditions. Hence the name. Um, this is a very well known definition, but it captures all three essential perspectives of a derivative. First, it has to be a contract, and then it has to be derived from something else, be it a financial instrument or any other uh, conditions in the future. It could be weather, it could be a stock price, it could be, uh, it could be air policy, and it has to target sometime in the future. And we'll uh, explain on this in a bit. Just in case, if the definition is too abstract, uh, this is a concrete example of a derivative. Uh, this is probably one of the first derivatives in the uh, recorded history that was used by the Sumerians a few thousand years ago. And I like this example. Well, it's kind of hard to guess how it works. Uh, but I just look at it. Basically, uh, the uh, small stones on the bottom are used for accounting purposes, and the place open on the top are used to seal the small stones. So not only does this have all the uh, three characteristics of a derivative, uh, it's got some interesting features such as a temper-proof technology. Um, and what, what we can take away from this is our ancestors a few thousand years ago has already can, can still teach us a thing or two about accounting fraud, fraudulation. Right? They have they have to uh, uh, develop some technique to prevent this. Um, this is exactly like a forward contract. So when you when you buy or uh, or barter for this, you're guaranteed to be delivered a fixed amount of uh, commodities at some given time in the future. So now we know what it is of this. Let's take a look at the market and its uses. Why do people trade it? Why did it exist in the first place? Um, modern derivatives first existed for hedging purposes or for risk management purposes. And when the market became large, investors and speculators, uh, especially large institutes, got into the market as well. The um, market is pretty attractive to them due to the high leverage nature of derivatives. And it also provides various strategies, uh, enables the investor to utilize various strategies that are not. Um, 
that cannot be uh, done with only other lines. It also provides some arbitrage opportunities. Um, also, another use of it is it actually it, it, it gives you the exposure to uh, typically non-tradable underlying assets, for example, volatility or credit risk or even weather. And uh, besides these three uses, uh, having derivatives in the market actually have some other benefits as well. First, uh, it greatly accelerates the process of price discovery. Um, economically, price discovery is the process of supply and demand finding equilibrium, right? Um, not only does it help with that, it could also help with the uh, process of volatility discovery, like how the market participants, um, it's basically like consensus on, uh, on volatility um, on the market. Um, it also improves market efficiency by reducing arbitrage opportunities. This, 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 you might think this is contradictory to uh, uh, the bulk points, um, but actually how it's interesting, how it works is when something produced, it gives you uh, more, more tools to take advantage of arbitrage, more market participants will be doing that. Um, and that actually will eventually reduce the profit margin, um, or in other words, it will reduce uh, the, uh, the gap uh, between a multi-track markets that does reduce the uh, arbitrage opportunities. So, so it's like a um, force and counterforce uh, kind of logic. Um, well, so what's, here comes the interesting part. Why are we interested in this market? Well, first, because it's huge. See, this is the exchange market. The total size of the exchange market in the first half of 2017 actually reached 134.5 trillion US dollars. And this is a huge market. Um, the advantage of it exchanges, it's, uh, it's a, central, a centrally regulated uh, market for credit risk. Um, and then the OTC market is even larger, actually. This is 483 trillion is the number I have in, in the, uh, the brochure. Uh, this is the number our CEO actually uses, but uh, I tried to be more updated. In the first half of 2017, the market size actually reached 545 billion US dollars. And on the high end of the market, it's actually 1.2 quadrillion. Notional. So if these numbers doesn't appear to be uh, too, uh, these numbers are not illustrative now, then let's just do some comparisons. The GDP of China in 2016 is 11 trillion US dollars. That's about 2% of the total notional size of the derivative market. And we have a few other comparisons, like um, on the high end, crypto token and cryptocurrency, uh, the total market capacity of those two are one, about 1 trillion. Right now it's about four, uh, 400 billion. Um, but on the high end, it's one trillion. That's that's like 0.2 percent of the notion of the OTC market. Uh, we we got some other comparisons as well. Um, just gonna skip that for time purposes. And we can also do, uh, break the market down by uh, geographically. As we can see in this chart, in 2010, Asia market has already surpassed North America to become the largest market for futures. And um, for options in the Asian market, or Asian Pacific market, it's not gaining much traction, mainly because of China. Um, does any of you here know how many listed option um, equities are, are traded in China currently? Does any of you have any idea? Well, just one. Um, it's the Shanghai 50 ETF uh, option. Um, however, on the other hand, the OTC market are, in China is actually gaining a lot of traction recently. In 2017, the total notional value of uh, China's OTC option market actually grew more than 10 times from 2016. Which means the market is actually gaining a lot of activity um, and it's attracting a lot of large institutes uh, to, to join the market. And eventually, China will open up its uh, listed option uh, trades as well. Actually, it, it used to have uh, equity options on trade, but um, somehow it got stopped for some reasons, but it's, it's poised to, uh, to be relisted, and the market is poised to uh, 
grow much bigger in size. So now we know um, what the relatives are, how they are used, and I, we have a glimpse of the size of the market. Let's look at some of the difficulties and solutions of the market. So these are the three core problems of the current OTC market. I'm going to focus on the OTC market since that's what Virginia does. Um, but I'm going to do some comparison with the exchange market as well. So first, this is, well, the biggest problem is, of course, credit risk. When you have a contract, you have counterparty risk for credit risk, right? And uh, we have operational efficiency as the second uh, major problem. And we have liquidity <coughs> or lack of uh, liquidity in the realm. And um, we actually have other problems like lack of variety, um, but I'm just going to focus on three core problems. So credit risk, where does credit risk come from? First, it comes from the participants. The participants of the market may come from very different backgrounds. Uh, for example, you might want to hedge your position uh, in soybeans, if you're a uh, soybean, uh, or if you're an agricultural conglomerate. Um, you might be a logist to like Chase or Goldman Sachs, or you might even sometimes be retail investors, even though the threshold for retail investors is pretty high. But all, all those different people have different risk tolerance. Um, they have different methods for their risk management. So um, it's kind of difficult for them to, to reach consensus. And um, they actually give grounds for, uh, uh, for credit risk. And then we have contracts currently in the OTC market. It's, it's quite different than the exchange market. The contracts are written by people on papers. Mostly, some of them are online, but mostly still on papers. And when something is, is written on papers by people, it's got a, it has a tendency to lead to disputes, right? And um, the third source for credit risk is insufficient regulation. So this is pretty easy to understand um, because it's, it's an over-the-counter market. Uh, it doesn't have central regulations. Um, and then default handling. This is a interesting thing. So once a party defaults, the process of settlement can take months or even years. This basically totally destroyed the, the very purpose of having derivatives. The first purpose is hedging, right? If you want to uh, do your time-sensitive hedging, say, in, in three months, and then someone defaults, and then you spend another three months to, to settle the default, it actually this totally um, nullifies the, uh, the value of hedging of those derivatives. And um, let's uh, take a look at how um, the OTC market and the exchange market uh, deal with uh, these problems. So how does the OTC de uh, market deal with credit risk? Well, first, well, through collateral, basically. Um, but when you've got collateral, collateral are not free. Basically, capital or assets are not free. Um, so in order to uh, have collateral, you have to, there are some extra costs involved in that. And due to that extra cost, uh, credit value adjustments and default value adjustments are added to the cost of trading derivatives, uh, which is pretty hectic price. And after the 2019 subprime crisis, um, with the introduction of GOATs and X such as Friend or Basel 3, collaterals become even more expensive due to more restrictions. Um, on them. So we got funding value adjustments, capital value adjustments, margin value adjustments, and even sometimes tax value adjustments. So these are all added to the cost of trading derivatives so OTC. Uh, not to mention the brokerage fee. So the brokerage fee is a little bit lower in the States, but it's uh, quite high in China. As, as I said, China's OTC market just getting traction. Um, and on average, I have, I have uh, a few friends who's doing uh, this. And they told me, on average, the brokerage fee uh, on OTC options is like 7 to 15 percent. So basically, when you trade an option, you have to pay extra 7 percent as brokerage fee. And that's in addition to these value adjustments. So the cost is really high. And this also leads to uh, more uh, operational inefficiency, uh, which I'm going to explain in a bit. And how does the, the exchange market deal with that? Well, through margin and clearing funds. Um, basically, if, if you have traded derivatives or even stocks on, on leverage, you, 
you know you, you have a margin account, right? The exchanges collect margin from you, um, and the central clearinghouse collects margin from the exchanges. Um, and then clearinghouse also has a pool uh, to serve as clearing fund as an actual buffer um, in case uh, some systematic, uh, systematic um, prices happens. Um, but this, this thing is also costly. It's a lot cheaper than uh, having collaterals, um, but it's, it's still costly. The exchanges will have commissions, the clearinghouse will charge you clear, clearing fees. But what's, um, what's, what prevents all the OTC, as we saw, OTC market is a lot larger than this. What prevents us from putting everything to exchange are um, actually the uh, first is the flexibility of the OTC market. So when I enter into a trade with any of you, um, over the counter, the terms and conditions of the contract are actually uh, negotiated between us. Whereas on the exchange, you can only have standardized contracts. And uh, uh, one other major reason why we don't just turn to exchange is that um, um, not all market can afford this. So actually, it's the total size of uh, clearing fund for at OCC um, is about. Uh, 10 billion, and uh, the total margin size is like five times, uh, at least five times of that. Um, and the government has to, the SEC or the government has to uh, put some money into the clearing fund. Um, also, um, the, uh, the, the time and uh, money it takes to build the infrastructure of the central clearing fund and the exchanges is, is hectic as well. So those all prevents um, the OTC market being all moved to the exchange. And the second problem is efficiency. I'm just gonna go over these quickly um, due to time limit. So the process of an OTC, this is an example of the process of an OTC option transaction. It takes at least seven steps. Requirement analysis, OTC, option design, price coding, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not gonna read all of these. Um, and many of these steps actually involve manual work. Actually, all of them involve manual work. Some of them involve partial manual work. Some of them are entirely done by human beings. And this can be slow and costly. As I said, the uh, brokerage fee, fee are part, uh, partially covering these steps. And third, we have uh, uh, liquidity problems. So, um, what are what is the solution? Well. Fortuna, right? Uh, after all, I'm the vice president of Fortuna, and I wouldn't be here even if, if it wasn't for this. Um, and we are the first DLT-based solution to the global OTC directors market. However, what I want you to really take away from this presentation is that the, uh, the solution is actually decentralized ledger, uh, ledger technology, including blockchain. And I just want you to, uh, I'm just going to use Fishuna as an example to il illustrate how uh, this technology can help attack the three problems of the current OTC market. So from now on, all the, uh, the, the tech details um, will be using Fishuna as examples. Okay, so DMS. I'll explain later what DMS is. Um, first, we could use uh, a consensus algorithm since um, the core of a um, of the core of credit risk is basically a trust system, and one of the uh, features of blockchain is to build a trusted system, um, meaning that you don't have to rely on um, offline credibility or due diligence in order to. Uh, um, analyze the trustworthiness of your counterparty. Um, and in Fortuna, we use a uh, consensus algorithm called Deposa, which is an extension of Depos. Basically, it's Depos uh, in addition to activities. Basically, the nodes uh, that provides the most activity or the most trading volume and liquidity will have more ways. And then the center of the problem is actually smart contract. Um, so our contracts is a block of code that can be run on the, on the chain or uh, on the virtual machine of blockchains. And we can actually replace, as we 
known one of the three characteristics of a third of this is a contract. We've actually replaced a traditional contract with a smart contract, uh, which, will, which can be automatically executed upon exploration, um, and which can be programmable to suit the uh, specific needs of the two current parties. And we, can also, we could also produce a, uh, well, in Fortuna, we, we can we enable the user to have a decentralized coding scheme, uh, sort of like an equity governance uh, entity um, that motivates the coder to provide price, uh, precise prices, um, and this could reduce the uh, possibility for price manipulation. And uh, on chains, on blockchains, we could have, uh, well, even with the above, we features of blockchain, people can still, I mean, after all, people are doing the trade, people can still have disputes, and should that uh, situation happen, uh, we, we could have a uh, whole net arbitration system. We're not even whole net, maybe part of the net, but it's, it's a, a consensus-based arbitration system. Um, the, uh, the parties at dispute can apply for arbitration, and, they can, and people who would like to arbitrate on this uh, will take this application. Um, of course, they have to be paid, um, and that pro which prevent uh, which provides in incentives for the arbitrators. And once the arbitrators or the arbitration corporations uh, form the consensus, it will uh, propagate back to the dispute uh, the, the parties of the dispute, and um, the result will depend on how, how the uh, arbitration end up. And this is actually similar for coding scheme. You could call for, uh, for yourself, or you could form a coding uh, corporation to provide even better services and uh, uh, and to, to gain even more uh, profit from, from this. So this is exactly what blockchain is about. It's providing incentives for all the different delegates, all the different uh, roles and nodes in the chain to do something valuable for the entire system. And finally, we have credit score. This is pretty easy to understand. This is also uh, due to a, a building feature of, of DLT, which is traceability. So all the historical transactions can be traceable on the, uh, on the chain. So credit score or credit record is, is pretty easy to maintain. It's just a natural uh, byproduct of the technology. And all of these five actually forms, forms a DMS. DMS is a decentralized margin system. It's, it's kind of like the margin system used by an exchange, but it's decentralized with these properties. So not only does it have the benefits of a centralized exchange and clearinghouse, it also has these benefits and other benefits of a decentralized system. Um, so this could effectively solve or at least attack um, credit risk in some sense. And besides that, um, oops, we have, uh, again, uh, we have, uh, yeah, so furthermore, uh, furthermore you uh, in order to increase op operational efficiency, um, we actually, and reduce extra cost, uh, we again, first we can have smart contracts um, to further help us. Uh, Fortuna actually has a, something called structured smart contracts, uh, which has a main contract on the top and uh, a uh, and contract templates as, as middle layer and individual contracts um, on the bottom, and each being a uh, being inherited from the uh, from the, the uh, above layer. It's like a hierarchy system for smart contracts, which actually reduces the time for market participants to, to code up their own smart contract because we already have templates and smart contracts and, and even uh, implemented smart contracts. So what this does is, besides uh, reduce the time for parties to, to build up, to design their contract, it also gives incentive for other market participants or large institutes to provide their templates um, of smart contracts or even their implemented contracts. Um, so for example, who, whoever produces a very popular contract template will get some incentive um, from everyone who uses this template. 
and this is also um, a this is also a feature of Tuna. And smart contracts actually already invest a lot of the uh, the points here, like automatic settlement, digital signature, identification, and code and price uh, matching. That was covered by the uh, the coding scheme. Um, in addition, we have data and statistics uh, for market for uh, for professionals. I mean, market data is pretty valuable. That's what exactly how Bloomberg started their company. They started by collecting and, and compiling and analyzing and selling and selling their data. Um, but currently, in the OTC market, in the exchange market, it might be easier. Um, but in the OTC market, um, it's kind of hard to uh, yeah. keep track of all the transactions, their prices. Um, and, and stuff. But once we put everything on chain to switch visibility, um, we can actually pack data much more easily. Um, this actually reduces the cost for, uh, for data scientists, uh, etc. And then last but not least, the, um, this is just an example used by Fortuna. It doesn't have to be the only uh, way of doing things, but what Fortuna is, is, is actually like a marketplace for OTC derivative participants. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Alibaba or Taobao. Uh, large institutes can actually open their shops on the chain. So the chain is not a trading platform. It's just a marketplace where shops can be opened uh, upon. And it works like a consumer-based or, or um, ecosystem where different participants actually have their own Entity on the chain, and they compete with each other in terms of um, in terms of security, cost, efficiency, etc. So this actually um, this competition provides a fair uh, well, it adds some fairness to the market at least, and um, this uh, this actually helps also increase liquidity because um, people when people when, when some large shops gain uh, a lot of credibility, when people will not. Uh, spend too much effort on due diligence on those uh, uh, shops. Um, it's it's kind of like the ecosystem, sort of, in some sense. Uh, let's talk about. So let's go back to the first questions, a uh, few questions we were trying to answer in this presentation. Why blockchain and why derivatives? If you are a uh, if you are a financial practitioner who's doing OTC derivative trading. Why do you want to use blockchain? Well, besides the, uh, we've seen how blockchain uh, can exactly, more precisely attack the three core problems of the market. It also um, is one of, it should be one of the, uh, um, it also, well, in, in the past few decades, the OTC market, or the derivative market in general, usually actually always was among the first adopters of new technology, including a quantitative of an, an, uh, analysis um, and uh, hyper-consistent trading and those, all those sort of stuff. Um, so it would be natural for, uh, for it would be natural for, for this market to uh, be interested in this, uh, any new technology, including DLT. Um, on the other hand, why do, if you're a blockchain developer or if you're a blockchain company, why would you be interested in the derivative market? Well, first, because it's huge. So it's so lucrative that you don't have to start large, you can start small and still make profit to survive until you are, a, you are well established. Um, however, what's most important is just focus on the, the picture to the right. What you see is a distributed ledger that's right there. But if you cover that up and just stare at it and, and uh, feel it, this is actually also a um, graph for the OTC derivative market. So what do those things have in common? Basically, both of them are a peer-to-peer -peer market in nature. So, Basically, we can say um, DLT is a natural solution to the OTC market. On the other hand, 
the OTC market is a natural use case for the blockchain technology. And I'd like to uh, wrap up my presentation with this quote. Um, this is from the author of Little Prince. If you want to build up a ship, don't jump up the people to get the worst divide work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the end, the vast end and the sea. Um, this is one of the quotes um, I heard from our CEO. He likes this a lot. Um, and I hope after the presentation, some of you here will be looking for the uh, vast sea of the financial derivative market. And after the events today, all of you will be uh, yearning for the endless sea of the DLT technology. Thank you very much. Time for one question. Sorry, Brad. So, um, a number of years I chaired CPMI Ayahuasca, which okay. I chaired CPMI Ayahuasca for a number of years, which showed the standards of the hearing and settlement of agreements and exchanges around the world. It's yeah. quite fascinating here because we're discussing at the Financial Stability Board recently the fact that we spent 10 years working on hearing and settlement at OTC derivatives. And one of the central bankers said, so we wasted our time. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny because we saw that it basically, you know, if this can happen, it basically uh, makes um, a, you know, CCP, central hearing counterpart, is redundant, basically, because of the ability to have basically atomic sub swaps or settlements. So yes. it's actually quite exciting. Thank you. Although probably quite challenging for a few people. Yes, because effectively that's really what it means, doesn't it? I mean, if, if you can do it, I think it's great. Right. Okay. It hasn't. It hasn't been done yet. Though, right. right. It hasn't been done yet. We are. Um, we had a roadmap. Our main nets will be online in uh, in Q3, mm -hmm. and we're currently we're uh, we'll have a test net. We'll have a test for the uh, the front end. Applications. So I suggest you, you should engage with C, um, CPMI Ayosco because it's, it's still, I mean, for regulators, they're concerned about counterparty risk, and if you can find solutions like this, it's right. So, well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last question for you. Um, we've been looking at this space uh, mostly for uh, advancement of uh, health. Underwriters, so there's large issues with insurance and various things, and these values are large enough to be used as backing for other uh, financial uh, events. Right. Um, when you're going through that process, I understand you shortening the timeline. Do you have? Are you going to be also supplying value that's going to store the? So you'll have a, an arbitrage of counterparty risk value um, in some sort of uh, value state like blockchain. Blockchain. Won't be able, I mean, Bitcoin would marketplace would be able to handle these value assets right. at these levels. Are you going to come up with a separate value asset? Uh, currently, we have our own token, but it's going to become a cryptocurrency when our mainnet is online. But the design of Fortuna is, is not it does not restrict you to uh, restrict you uh, to only be able to use our token or for cryptocurrency. You can actually. How it works is you open a shop or you open an account and you can uh, transfer your Bitcoins or other currencies into it. Um, that's an actually a good point. What about the legal currencies? Currently, we're not, we don't have plans to support legal currencies. Um, but there's another thing called legal cryptocurrency, like the one China, the Central Bank of China is developing right now. And we are looking into, uh, we're actually talking to uh, people in China when we're trying to uh, uh, bring that into our our uh, system. And if that's the case, I mean, then um, we'll have sort of like back, uh, backup from the Chinese government. And, um, um, but anyway, we besides that, we do support all the other cryptocurrencies to be traded um, on our main chain. For example, if you want to use collateral, right? If, or if you want to use margin, like decentralized margin system, you still have to put in some margin. Right. Um, then you can use any crypto asset as your margin. margin. That's and the that means to create a collateral set that you can then use. To yes, those will all be in, encapsulated in a smart contract. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We should talk some more. All right, thank you. Yeah. Please do. Okay, right. thank you. Um, please join me.
Thank you.